my name is Paul. And this is Ryan. And today we are complaining about the city that dripped blood. Yes, the city of drip blood by Steve Winter. This is a fifth edition adventure for fourth level PCs. Uh, originally published in 2018 by a Frog God Games, and it is available on their website. And people are buying it. Uh, Maybe. Maybe. Um, so the adventure that's not an adventure is set in the city of Tamelpa, which used to be a bustling trade city, which is now under the vampiric influence of a blood orchid... Um, plant? plant? It's a plant thing. Um there is the Skeksis, uh, I mean the Skeltsies, which is <laughs> humanoid things with bird beakies. There's where dactyls that live in there, um, which Ryan will get to later, I'm sure. And then there's a host of humans and gnomes, which are the slaves of the Skeltsies and the were dactyls, or the podlings, if you watch The Dark Crystal. Um, there's lots of vampirism, cannibalism that happen in the city, and it's normal yeah. and setting. Yeah, so general impressions, for me at least, that this isn't so much an adventure as it is a small city setting with a few plot hooks thrown through it. Uh, in my opinion, to actually use this at the table would require a, a lot uh, mm -hmm. of work on my part, which is, is kind of a turnoff for me when it comes to published uh, adventures because the whole reason of using a published adventure is to save me a lot of work so um eh, I, I didn't particularly care about that now that being said i think there are some very cool concepts baked into this setting and uh, setting and i think our conversation is mostly going to be about how you could turn this into a fun and engaging adventure um rather than what we liked about it because as is i don't think there's much mm -hmm. we actually we actually liked about it um you want to get something i, I can keep going but uh, your the, impressions uh yeah same thing it's an adventure that's not an adventure more so an outline of a setting it seems fairly incomplete there was parts of it that i did like i liked that he highlighted key NPCs in the city. I think mm. that's good. So you have some, I don't know, whatever information about them if your players happen to run into them. But otherwise, I there's a lot that I didn't like, but that's not to say that there's things in this that you couldn't turn into something that is a good adventure. To be polite, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, fair, fair enough. Yeah, like the hook of this is, I think, usable if you're in like a desert mm -hmm. setting and that you're all part of a caravan mm -hmm. that's going somewhere and then you're chased off by a bajillion gnolls. Yeah. Uh, I guess we can carry on the hook. I have some general complaints to make yeah. before we get to but yeah, we're in the hook already. I didn't like the hook. Yeah. At all. Mm hmm because as written as you were suggesting there you're basically on a caravan going from point a to point b and then the caravan is ambushed by an orc tribe and you survive and run away and get chased to these you know you see these ruin the city on the horizon is it a mirage is it not let's go investigate you get to the city and then the gnolls basically surround the city and keep you in there for an indeterminate amount of time. Until you as the DM are willing to let your PCs leave. Yeah. I disliked all of this so much because it's the worst kind of heavy-handed DMing mm -hmm. that, no, you're going to do this, and if you don't do this, you're going to die. Yeah, I mean, like, for me, it would be provide a hook for the players to stay. Yeah, give them but, a reason to be there. Yeah, exactly. You know, I don't like the idea of being somewhere because you couldn't survive out there mm -hmm. and now you're just in this place and forced to be part of its ecosystem which is not very well hashed out well even the hook doesn't make any sense because there's like over a hundred gnolls there that could sack the city in a heartbeat yeah i mean it's it, they mentioned that like the guard of the city is made up of only like 40 something guards and that they know that their numbers are finite and that if you start killing the guards then like unrest will happen in the city basically so yeah. it's like this no, this, this null tribe could just wipe everybody out in a heartbeat. So yeah. why aren't they going in? Because reasons. Looking at the hooks, I would have fixed this super easily by actually making it be an expedition to the city, right? The city used to be this super wealthy trade hub, okay? 
So you, you make, say, a descendant of the former ruler of the city wanting to go back and reestablish it, and it's been so long that nobody remembers why, you know, it, uh, it collapsed, right? There's rumors of blah, right? A scary flower showed up and we all fled type of thing. Um, but making an expedition to the city, then you have an actual goal, yeah. right? What is the goal? Well, you have the you know descendant of the former ruler, ruler wanting to come and claim the city again. You come there, wait, there's people here. And then you're suddenly forced to interact with the hierarchy and the political structure. And suddenly there, there's reasons to negotiate because you're working for a politician mm. effectively and maybe they don't want to just go in and murder people right you're hired as muscle on this expedition you know and then you're setting up a base camp in part of the city and this is going to get you into conflict with the skeltsies because they don't want you there but they kind of want to eat you so there's that type of conflict you can find out the blood orchid has been tapping into the oasis and the well springs and that's why things dried up maybe you know like yeah there's lots of things you could add yeah you, you can you can turn this into something a lot more workable with a little bit of effort, mm -hmm. right? But the biggest issue with the hook and the adventure in itself is there's nothing for the players to really do. There's yeah. no reason for them to be there other than you're not letting them leave, right? Mm -hmm. There's no incentive to explore. There's no real payoff for exploration either, like in terms of just goodies. Now, it's a fifth edition adventure, which, you know, treasure's not as crazy in terms of magic items, but still winning doesn't really feel good mm -hmm. i guess because there is no reason to win it's sort yeah it sort of feels like he ran this at his own table maybe and like thought of it on the fly and then wrote it down and is selling it it's, yeah, it's, like, it's, it's a cool idea yeah. like don't get me wrong like the, the city setting is great but in terms of what i'm looking for um it's there's not enough there Right, like it's here's a cool setting, do something with it. I'm like, eh, I don't want to pay money for a nifty setting, not when it's marketed as an adventure, yeah. Right, if this was marketed as a cool little mini setting, well, that's completely different, but this isn't really an adventure. And, and well, I guess we'll get into like the what makes the city neat, but I have a couple of general design decisions, I guess, that kind of bugged me to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. uh, number one is that the, the ruling class, these extra dimensional bird people, the renamed Skeksis, if you will, are vampires, but they're not undead. Yes. Because of reasons that don't make any sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Right? Because interacting with this blood orchid has somehow given them the need to drink blood, but aren't actually vampires. Yeah. And... I don't like it. Okay. I, I get that vampires are potentially difficult for this level of player. Mm -hmm. Right. Not that fifth edition vampires are particularly scary anymore, but that's a separate long term complaint of mine. Uh, but why do they need to have the vampiric aspect whatsoever? Just make them cannibals. Right? Yeah. They don't have to drink your blood. They're going to eat people. Mm -hmm. Right. I just, it, doesn't work for me to have something that's being touted as a vampire that's not actually a vampire um, I get sort of the idea of subverting player expectations mm -hmm. which which part of this is oh there's vampire creatures oh we, we try to turn them and it doesn't do anything because they're not un undead right they're just weird yeah. creatures um, so that might be the the reason behind yeah this decision but i i'm not necessarily the biggest fan of trying to subvert tropes that much mm -hmm. i mean there's, there's classic usages for good reasons and i feel that just trying to constantly subvert the expectations is a little played out to a certain extent yeah I you mean, know smarter people than me have put a lot of effort into creating this world might as well use it yeah, but it's, it's not even that, right? Like, I mean, it, and this is sort of off topic, but it's getting to the point where goblins are a playable race, mm. right? You know, you, you can't just make goblins the little things that burst, you know, steal children and eat faces anymore, right? Because, well, that's not all goblins. 
Mm-hmm. There's, there's good goblins out there that want to help people. It's like, no, you can just make a horrible little monster. Mm-hmm. Right? They don't always have to be good. Yeah. Remember when Drow were evil? Now yeah. they're just another player race. Yeah. Right? Like, I, I, I think it's fine to have certain tropes. I think it's fine for vampires to be undead and always undead. Yeah. And that is the thing that they are. Yeah. Now, I guess that, yes, the word vampire gets used not only for undead. Vampire bats aren't undead. Like, I, I get it. Um, but when when I'm dealing with my D&D here, I, I feel like certain words mean certain things. Mm-hmm. Right? They eat the flesh of uh, the dead. They should be ghouls, too. Right? right. So these are vampiric ghoul skitsies because mm-hmm. they have this certain behavior. And I don't know. I just That bugged me to a certain point. And then, as you mentioned, uh, were dactyls. No, that's just a big old nope for me. Um, you're a were dinosaur, right? Dinosaurs in D and D already. I'm on the fence of yeah right? certain settings, maybe, maybe. Yeah. right? If you want to do a land of the lost type of setting, I get it, works. But I, I feel that making every possible animal able to be a were variant gets to be a bit much right i'm not a pure purist i think werewolves obviously are the gold standard i have a soft spot in my heart for weir rats they work for me (laughs) uh outside of that it starts to get a little noodly like i guess were bears have a long history in D &D. I don't care for them yeah right and i guess that you know there are some Sort of culturally, thematically appropriate were creatures, like were jackals, have you know long history in actual like real life, or were jaguars. You know, they're, yeah. they're, they're regional variants yeah. of werewolves that totally make sense. But when we're starting to get like were pterodactyls, and like why aren't there were velociraptors? I'm a were T Rex. You know, like mm-hmm. were sharks. Like I yeah. know, like it gets to be a certain point where I'm like. When's enough is enough? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm a grump. Like, I'll, I'll give it that. But at a certain point, you don't need to have all of this continual flavor of different sentient races. Mm-hmm. Right? I feel that D&D is overstuffed with humanoid playable characters. Yeah. Right? Tortolans, I hate. Ericoa, no, that's not... That's, that's from, it's wow. That's wow. Uh, whatever the flying bird people in yeah, D&D. The avian. The avian the blah, blah, blah. Wow. Ugh. Yeah. Right? And and more and more and more and more. Like I, I get that lots of people like that. I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I get the argument from people being like, well, this is a role-playing game. I should be able to role-play whatever I want. So they've made that possible for people. But I am on your side. I like the more traditional... D and D were meant to be the playable races that we are, and just like back boil it back down to what it originally was. Well, I mean, originally whatever. Like, I just different player races are just used as reskinned humans with different stats, Mm -hmm. and this goes even for like dwarves and, and elves, right? I don't know that any of the settings actually bake things into it. Right, which is where things get super noodly. Instead of thinking of them as different species, which they really should be thought of as different species, they get thought of as like, no, you're just weird looking humans, and they have the same, you know, belief systems and values as we do, even though they're a completely different species. Yeah. And I would probably have less problem with all of these different player races or races in general if they served an actual purpose in the world mm-hmm. right and um, it's it's made up and there's gods in a play like from a biologist a biological standpoint it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to have 50 different sentient species all just hanging out together like it just it, no it, it wouldn't work bring they're all gods his favorites i guess right like I, I can hand wave that aspect of why they exist but Make them interestingly distinct from each other, mm-hmm. right? But they're not. They're they're all 
dioecious species or they're male and female like it'd be super cool if there was you know if dwarves laid eggs you know and there was no female dwarves mm-hmm. right they're just a, a, a unisex species yeah and i think like the heart of it is like even if you know we choose you're choosing to play a different race that you're never going to be able to act the same as that race is supposed to be right like we're always going to just play them as humans because we're reflecting ourselves sort of in them yeah. right so it's like no matter what you play you're just going to kind of play as a human regardless of what's the written yeah you're going to play yourself with different you know yeah. effectively which is which is a shame because what you could do when you design a race is you can just have a couple of core features mm-hmm. right and yes, is it stereotyping these random races? Absolutely, but that's the whole point because if you're not going to give a race or species, I guess when you think about it, stereotypical characteristics, then there's nothing for the player to hang their hat on, mm-hmm. right? You know? Well, it's sort of like in our campaign that we just started recently. I find like I'm in a tough spot being the only full-blooded dwarf, dwarf yeah. right? And having to, like, I'm not supposed to interact with the other people who have chosen to be half everything right mm-hmm. so it's like but i have to play the game with them so it's sort of you're caught in this between a rock and a hard spot and it's like well how do you role play someone that probably hates them mm-hmm. but also it's like i'm supposed to play the game with these people yeah so it's a little tough it's a little tough but i mean it doesn't even have to be something as harsh as that. that's because the game world's got a cast system and you yeah. know your player your character thinks should think that they're better than these other yeah people but you know it'd be something as simple as uh, a dwarf will never give something away for free, mm-hmm. you know, or an elf has no concept of ownership, mm-hmm. right? Or, you know, like there are certain, uh, there's a whole list of features that I can't remember. There's a list somewhere you can find, but there are certain characteristics that are common between all humans, regardless of cultural background. Yeah. Right. There's just a certain baked in cultural checklist. Mm-hmm. Humans all, regardless of, you know, hunter gatherer, agrarian, blah blah blah. They have these things, and like ownership is one of them, mm-hmm. right? Like that's regardless, is there's people understand what owning something means, means. yeah, right? So that's a list of things that make a human a human, right? And you could do a similar thing for any playable species, but you tweak it to you know you just give a couple of highlights, mm-hmm. right? And those are like easy rules to follow for a person, a player mm. to do, right? Yeah. Like it's easy to not. It, give it gives away you some role free. playing hooks, yeah. Right. It gives you a reason that distinguishes between a dwarf and an elf, yeah. Right. Uh, or a Goliath and a forest gnome, or something like that, right? You have to give the species definable characteristics mm-hmm. that give a player something to be able to build off of right um you, you could and it, it can be anything right i mean um a kender from the dragonland setting don't have a sense of they have no fear right that is a great characteristic because if you have no fear you're never going to be cautious you're never going to run away you're never going to have an idea what danger is and that provides you with a way of being able to um, play the game, yeah, right. You can have a race that doesn't fear death, mm-hmm. right? So that's never a concern for them, right? Uh, so you can have that type of fundamental differences that would actually distinguish between the different races, species, to give you something interesting about them, right? <clears throat> yeah, good points. Right. So, anyways. Getting back to the issue with the weredactyls, they serve no real purpose. They're just the Skeltsy's muscle. Um, and in, really, it could have been anything. Uh, I would have gone with something cooler. The golems would have been kind of neat or uh, undead. Mm. You know, I get that they need some sort of enforcer. Uh, yeah, it would have made more sense if it was something that they could create or pull from their plane of existence mm-hmm. that existed with them, or they just enslaved the things that lived there before. Like if they were like, what if they were lizard folks or something? You know, mm-hmm. like that would make a little more setting sense to the theme. I don't know. Like it just could be something interesting. Yeah. I think as written, the weird came with them from their dimension. Yeah, yeah. 
but because most of the time they just look like humans yeah unless they're in their hybrid forms it's kind of boring yeah like you could definitely make it interesting i I get the idea from a a gameplay standpoint of why you need muscle Mm -hmm. right the bird people themselves are not physically imposing if you will uh so having some sort of servitor protective guardian Mm -hmm. subclass if you will Mm -hmm. totally makes sense i probably would have gone with something a little bit more interesting Mm -hmm. so either created like you said golem of some sort animated blah 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 or something just you know, giant bug. If we're going with Skitsy, the Skitsy theme, giant beetles, you know, yeah. the bigger <laughs> bugs, yeah. bugs, right? Like that are intelligent enough to follow orders. Follow order, like <clears throat> giant scarabs or something. And then it even fits the uh, desert theme, right? Yeah, it makes sense for the big centipede to be in the Coliseum later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, intelligent insects are always sort of a, a plus. Mm-hmm. So those are just some design things that bug me, but. I guess back to our adventure that's not an adventure. Um, the city itself basically is the adventure. Like there's a couple of locations that are outlined in this module, but you don't even have to go to them, yeah. right? Like they're just a couple of places with some rooms. There's a map in there. The map's fine, you know, but it's just a couple of ziggurats that are in the in the city that you can maybe potentially interact with. So, so mostly the adventure is describing the current say a state of the city and some potential factions to interact with and things that might happen if you interact with those people. You know, I guess like the, the main um, mechanic of the adventure is showing up when you're there and determining how many days of rations you have as well like that's a mechanic that was built into the adventure Mm. and then that um like the supplies and exhaustion so it's like an internal timer but it's something to keep track of and then that i think that's maybe plays into the the gnome race too like when do you need to seek help from that gnome that comes and says like just hey how's it going yeah i mean i think you're basically forced to interact with the locals because yeah. you don't have enough food or water to survive uh, and the gnomes won't the gnomes the gnolls won't let you leave um, but there's not really there's no end game mm-hmm. right there's no defined goal for the players so i think what theoretically is supposed to happen is the players are supposed to feel bad for the plight of the gnomes and team up with the gnomish revolution or resistance and lead to an overthrow of the Skeksis and, you know, elimination of the blood orchid that is effectively ruling over everything. Like that, to me, is the implied progression of the adventure. Yep. But as written, it's simply implied. Yeah. Right? You have nothing in place to encourage your players to do any of this, Mm -mm. to interact with the gnomish resistance, right? To do anything. There's there's very little stopping the players from just exploring around a little bit. The gnolls leave and then they leave and they're like, oh, that was a waste of a couple of a a game session, (laughs) you know? Uh, Yeah, there's not even anything written into the adventure that's like fun loot to get. Like there's like absolutely nothing in here aside from observing what happens in the city. Mm -hmm. Like you can see the funeral procession taking a body up to the ziggurat, which they would feast on. uh, Well, I think, I think really what the adventure quote unquote adventure is trying to sell here is the macabre nature of the setting, right? There is no meat in the city except for long pork, if you will. So (laughs) yeah. Uh, cannibalism is the norm. So there's there's gardens that grow vegetables, but effectively everybody in the city is a cannibal. Uh-huh. So whenever someone in the city dies, their body is taken to one of the ziggurats where it is basically exsanguinated. The skitsies get the blood and then the meat's kind of divvied up and people eat it. So if the players end up interacting with any of the locals and you know have dinner with them, they will very likely be offered some dried meat, which is 
people, right? Yeah. It's soil and green. And I, I think a lot of the adventure kind of implies that your PCs are going to be offended by the setup. You know, like this is just wrong and we need to stop this. And these monsters are forcing people to do this and they're not. Everyone just sort of like, no, that's, that's what you do. Yeah, you, you eat people. Eat. Yeah. Um, and there, there's a certain level of injustice too. So if the meat stocks start uh, running low, people, you know, primarily the slave population, which happens to be the gnomes, mm. you know, someone gets accused of a crime and that's death. And then, hey, meat's back on the menu, right? So uh, there's that sort of aspect of it. I can't imagine that gnomes have that much meat on them. So No. I mean, from from just a stand, like economic logistical standpoint it doesn't work okay you, you you could not live off of the p you need way more gnomes than there are for them to be a herd uh you know to be actual food if you're killing them and then um what i'm gonna say they don't grow fast enough right like none of it makes any sense from a, an actual sort of logistic standpoint and the one thing I thought was a bit odd is there wasn't a big play up of exsanguination. Like you'd think you sh in the nature of the city is everybody would have to donate blood because blood is a renewable resource, mm. right? So the Sketi should be, you know, you, you get summoned to come to there and you get your blood drunk and then they let you go, right? Like that would make sense to me as sort of them being parasitic. But as written, it's like, no, the dead are the ones, you know, we ki they kill them and blah, blah, blah. Um, which like isn't vampires with morals. It just it, well, it's just not sustainable, right? So I think it would be more interesting if it was a functioning society, but you just have your blood drunk periodically, right? But everything else is Instead fine. Instead of coming over to collect rent, they're coming to the neighborhoods to shake down for the vials of blood. Well, imagine if it was a blood tax. Yeah, you're not taxed in coin; you're taxed in blood. And, and to me, that suddenly becomes a very interesting setup. You know, your random encounter is coming across the shop owners that's too fatigued. He's like, I let my blood yesterday. I can't do it today. Or it could be interesting if a situation is your taxes can be money or blood. Mm. And then suddenly rich people don't have to donate blood because they can afford to pay their taxes, which means that the you know blood sucking is predominantly going to affect the, the poorer castes. And then now you kind of an interesting uh, blah, blah, blah. Where's the words just disappeared from my brain? Sort of economy? a economy? Uh, yeah, sort of like a uh, injustice aspect going off of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's the, the poorer members of the society are being, you know, actually fed upon, whereas the rich people are just like, oh, here's, the, here's our taxes, here's our coin. Right, yeah. And I, I kind of kinda like that. Uh, as an idea that I just came up with literally right now and write that down, but that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, one other thing I would have liked to have seen in the adventure because there's cannibalism is uh, spongiform and cephalopathy, hmm. which is fancy science world word. And you're just like, I don't know what that is, <laughs> uh, but it's yeah, mad cow disease, if you will. Okay. Uh, or Kuru is the human variant of it. And, um, there are certain diseases that are transmitted by eating infected human tissue. And in a society that practices cannibalism, that should happen, right? The yeah. likelihood of it occurring would be very high. So you could have an interesting situation where what would happen if, say, the leader of the Skeksis developed, you know, mad cow kuru or what have you and it's starting to lose their mind because it's being destroyed so now you have a leader that's acting erratically and destabilizing the population right you're breaking the status quo and now you have the players coming into the situation where there's already this you know imbalance happening right the, the ones that are actually practicing the cannibalism are going crazy or maybe once again what if the cannibalism was uh caste based Right, so the lower castes don't get access to the sacred meat, but the higher castes do. So suddenly, they're the ones that are being disproportionately infected by, you know, that's a real world disease, but it could be magic cannibalism disease or what have you. Yeah. Right. Or 
isn't one of the things in D&D that's how ghouls form, mm-hmm. right? Ghouls form as part of, you know, being cannibalistic. So what if because of the ritualistic cannibalism, you know, the, the, the people that are practicing it are starting to become ghouls, right? And then that, again, makes this sort of a more interesting environment to engage with when you put some sort of uh, destabilizing force involved in it. Because, because as is, the PCs are coming into a, a stable environment and ostensibly to act as the agent of chaos. But there's not enough interesting things to engage with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To True. to to sort of make it fun, right? Because like, what do you do? Like, what what is there to do in here? Get, that, get captured, maybe. Maybe get captured, yeah. maybe interact with them. Fight a couple of beasts in their coliseum. If you break the law, yeah. right? Like I I don't I don't know as written what would happen. Mm-hmm. Right? It, it it's very much designed for the players to be proactive in it. Right? Your players have to be willing to engage with stuff. Like they can't be reactive at all because there's almost no instigating events at all. Yeah, and I just don't know like what his intention was when it's like, well, when did the Knowles leave? When you decide they leave? Yeah, like several what, days later. What is success? There is no success. Yeah. Right? That's there there is no win condition. But what's in this failure? adventure? Like there's no fail conditions either, you know. Well, like, you die. Or get bored. Yeah. Uh, getting bored at the table is a fail condition as, as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. But that's, that's basically it is you either decide to eliminate uh, the bird people and their bodyguards and the blood orchid mm-hmm. and understand that like most people don't want that to happen. Right. As written, basically the whole human population is like yeah, it's fine. Yeah, uh, and mo like basically the entire uh, gnome slave population is like this is the way it's always been. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, there's just the small pa- pocket of uh, you know the resistance that's like this is awful. We should say this. So like the <laughs> the vast you know it's obviously awful, right? Like they're they're in the right, but the vast majority of the individuals in the culture mm-hmm. are like no, this is this is the way it is. Yeah, so much. they're they're not gonna you know, join up to help you. Yeah. Right. Which is part of the reason why if you have, you know, the brain disease or ghoul things happening, then there's a reason for the normal quote unquote people in the society to be like, something's something's wrong. wrong. We need to, this needs to change. Uh, And then you can gain allies and it makes more sense. But when you're coming into a, a stability, you know, like, it's it's like the old missionaries coming into a culture be like, no, you're all heretics. You need to do the right way, and you just get killed, right? Yeah. Like, Cause like, yeah, like you said, like you're we're the bad guys in this situation. Yeah. But we've gotten been forced into a civilization that doesn't for want no us reason, there. That doesn't want us there, and now just because we don't agree with it, we're going to get rid of it. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna impose our moral order on we're this like, yeah, we're dysfunctional col- like colonizing them. Really, yeah, well, it's exactly. You know? It's yeah. almost. That now, granted, like there's some inju- there's a lot of injustice in this particular society, but who are we as PCs to yeah. say that that injustice is any different than the injustice in you know water deep or what have you, right? Yeah. So uh, th- there are some interesting issues with that um, from the inhabitant standpoint, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm not arguing that like yeah, ritualistic cannibalism and slavery is cool. It's like no, it's awful, right? But from their cultural standpoint. And they're from a different plane of existence mm-hmm. too. So. This is normal. This is what's always been done. And then you have the PCs showing up and be like, no, we're going to tell you the right way to do stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it would be maybe better that they hadn't been there for so long, that these laws being imposed were newer. Maybe mm-hmm. it, this wasn't the always the way that it was, mm-hmm. right? Like that they've it's been long enough that they're used to it, but not long enough that people haven't remembered what it was like when the city was flourishing, yeah. you know, cause then that's another reason to get, you know, these things that came from another plane mm. out of here. Right. Yeah. Like I, I think you just need some sort of reason that why at the time that the PCs show up, 
that the populace would be willing to get rid of the uh, their conquerors, if you will. Yeah. Right. Like there just needs to be some incentive to want them gone. Right. And it doesn't have to be much. I can be like maybe the blood tax keeps going up because mm-hmm. the skitsies keep needing more and more blood or or what have you. Right. You just need something that has changed in the society that bringing the PCs in can serve as sort of the match to start the revolution, mm-hmm. right? Um, but as written, there's there's no appetite for it, mm-hmm. right? So the PCs sticking their necks out is more likely to get their heads chopped Chop. off yeah. than to have everyone, you know, line up behind them and join the revolution. Yeah, like, and I think it's, you know, if anyone knows Steve Winter out there, <laughs> what, are, what are his what are his original ideas you know it would be interesting to hear mm. um like what the plan was or what the intention was or what happened before this adventure or happened after it like was this a bigger part of a campaign that they ran and mm. this was just the section that you chose to pull out and present but it's it's a i mean it's a setting it's an neat. interesting yeah. setting right i mean and it's, like we haven't really done any desert based you know uh, as techie and i guess mm. types adventures right like mm. um no i mean I, I think i think the premise has a lot of merit it just felt a little unfinished from what i'm expecting from a module yeah right and everyone has different expectations and what have you but uh I didn't feel there was enough meat in there and get, we're generating a lot of discussion around something that you know I feel is a little unfinished, but so that speaks a lot to the interesting nature of the setting, but everything that I'm suggesting is just work for me. Mm-hmm. And I think I've mentioned previously that like when I buy a published adventure, it's because I don't have the time to do it myself. I want something that's pretty table ready. And, you know, comparing this to Mad God's Key, for example, that we did you know in the last episode, it's, it's kind of night and day because yeah. the Mad God's key, like I could read it once and sit down and be ready to go and throw in a little bit of improvisation here or there to tie things together with minimal prep. Whereas this, I feel that I'd have to put substantial amount of effort into it and craft encounters and, and, and stuff along those lines just to make it um, feel complete, mm-hmm. to, to flesh it out, to, mm-hmm. to, to be playable, if you will. Mm. Um I guess I guess we'll t- let's talk about what's there instead of just complaining about stuff in, in general. I guess so uh, about the city itself. I felt that it was pretty difficult uh, for this pe- people, the PCs, to actually move around in it. Right, like you're foreigners, you can't really be incognito. Well, that's why you meet the gnomes because they know the safe ways to travel mm-hmm. throughout the city. So that's a motivation to become friendly with the gnomes because they can show you around, basically. But it's only the right gnomes, though, right. right? Like you need to get contacted by the resistance. But regardless, he will. comes and just meets you whenever you decide. Mm-hmm. There is no triggering event in which you would meet him. It's just a curious gnome, uh, Fulgar, the gnome outcast. Um, he's never seen outsiders mm. before, so he just comes and introduces himself. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, What else we got in here? I, one thing I thought was uh, would have made it better is if they hadn't gone with an extra planar weird bird person. Because mm-hmm. imagine if the, the bad guys, the, the top of the hierarchy, were basically human looking. Right? What if you'd, they'd gone with like a variant vampire or a variant ghoul or something like that? And suddenly it makes it easier to have this all a little more ambigu- ambigu- ambiguous. Ambiguous is the word mm-hmm. I'm looking for. Because right? like imagine if the situation actually was that the blood orchid took root and like infected the ruling, like the, the ruling family. Yeah. And changed them in a way that they're now, you know beholden to it and dependent on blood for survival and they're the ones that have been changed you know they change the society to tweak it and suddenly you're just dealing with people and not weird looking creepy bird creatures yeah or make it so that the people aren't the things that want the blood it's the demand of the blood orchid 
Oh, they're like so tithing to yeah, it or something. So they like yeah. have to water the flower in right? blood. In blood. And for and but then you sort of need and a reason. As like, the bigger the plant gets, it needs the more, more blood. blood it needs. So they're having to like stretch to the gnomes now to because they don't have enough blood, right? Mm -hmm. So well, and then suddenly you have the blood tax going up and going mm -hmm. up and going up, and maybe sometimes people are dying because they take right. too much and that's suddenly changing like that, that explains you know and the hook could then come from like the cousin or the uncle of this family that they're no longer in touch mm -hmm. can you go investigate and see what's going on and now you found that they become slaves yeah. to the blood orchid and they initially like you could say like the blood orchid was a gift from a visiting whatever right to give oh pay okay. Homage it's to even, them. The thing is, it could even be like an extra planar being. Yeah, exactly. Bestowed like maybe, this beautiful maybe, flower on their garden. Yeah, and it turns maybe out... one Skeltsies came at one point and planted this thing and said, "You need to." We're turning this into the little shop of horrors. I just a realized. Bit, yeah, but you know, like it, <laughs> that'd yeah, be awesome. You know, so it's yeah, maybe it is, but that uh, that makes I think a little bit more of a cohesive reason, like and that when the gnomes approach you, it's because they're concerned and they've never had to give blood before, but now the reach is extending beyond Well, the, the, the gnomes palace. are the slaves. They'd always yeah. be the... But what I, you could also have it that maybe now money isn't accepted anymore in taxes. Mm -hmm. Maybe everybody has to give blood and suddenly the rich people are giving blood too and, well, they're angry about it. So suddenly you have wealthy patrons that are willing to disrupt the status yeah. quo. And instead of being chased in the city, perhaps you are like prisoners of... Um, a smaller community coming to pay their tax, you mm. know, and like that's why you got captured because, or you were captured by the gnolls, maybe to or and they're the tax, right? Maybe like, you set it, it set up that you can, you or you have to give the blood tax, but where do you get the blood from? Mm -hmm. So maybe what happens is the richer families have started hiring people to raid the countryside because right. if they capture prisoners they can give the pcs as exactly, their blood yeah. tax instead yeah. of having to give their own so now you're in the blood. city about to be part of this tax and can help that's a better motivation like while well, you don't well, suddenly that sounds like a super awesome adventure i have to write this down like, yeah like, like, you know like that's cool and then, yeah. and um so i mean you have to tweak with it and try to figure out like why like what hold does this plant have mm-hmm like why are they beholden to the plant like mm -hmm. what are they actually like what's the plant do for the city you know because a, vamp a vampiric plant seems mm. more easy to explain than a whole society of non-vampiric vampires what what if <clears throat> what if you know their oasis went dry their wells went dry mm -hmm. and then you know they prayed or sacrificed or what have you and they were gifted with this plant and this plant brought the is oasis it, back. Is it the way that the Skeltsies colonize? Yeah, you know? yeah, if you still have them. But like you could just make it something like the plant, you know, brought the water back. Or yeah. is responsible for bringing the water out of it. But to keep the plant alive, it requires blood. So you have this situation where the city is dependent on the plant for the water. Because without it, the city will die. But the plant has reached the point where it's so large that the city is starting to die because... Is being eaten, right, so you put them in cycle. this. Yeah. yeah, you put them in this really difficult situation that, you know, a city that maybe should have died centuries ago has continued to persist through this blood pact, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I kind of am digging. I mean, that sounds like a cool concept, right? Yeah, I'm, so, I'm digging that as an yeah. as, as a venture concept, right? Especially if you bring it in, like it's it's a it's, you can add a demonic aspect. Yeah, into well, it. now it's provided us with. A reason to be there, mm. a reason to be together, and motivation while we're there, yeah. which is all things I think that the adventure sort of lacked in the beginning. So there's yeah. no reason for us to be there except the reason that the DM put us there. Of course, and then you throw in like the gnomish resistant rescues the PCs, mm. and now you're tied into the gnomish resistance, and then you got NPCs and hooks and a goal, and and what have you. Yeah, and that sounds super super fun to me to be honest <laughs> yeah it does sound cool and you know like i think like another neat idea that i just thought of like it could be that like if it was gifted say by an extra planer being a skeltsies mm -hmm. that could be mm -hmm. like maybe they they sucked their plane dry mm -hmm. and they needed to recolonize and like the fruit of the blood orchid could be like that's how skeltsies are birthed right mm -hmm. like you know you could it, it could be a neat way to think about it too but yeah, that sounds a little bit better than just like bird people sucking blood for fun and you're just stuck there. Mm -hmm. 
Right, it's just you, you got more direction because mm-hmm. yeah, this is as is. There's it's 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 a little too free form for me. Like it's not even like a, a it's not even like a hex crawl because there's not really triggered encounters that you would in, run into. It's just like here's the thing. There's people. It's just a place for you to observe, mm-hmm. really, and it's like okay, well, we can see their culture, and now what? Mm. Which isn't much. So yeah, uh, I guess in terms of like actual. Oh, uh, actual adventuring locations. There are the two ziggurats. There's the ruling one, and then there's the one where the dead are prepared. Um, neither of them are particularly exciting. I mean, uh, even at fourth level, I think the PCs could easily just eliminate all of the threats in the entire city in a couple of days. Right? Like you already mentioned that there's almost the Crimson Guard, the City Watch. There's like 40 people, and they're all level one warriors or what have you. So you could totally destroy them. There's, what, nine Skeltsies or something along those lines. So the the PCs in a direct, just we're bored, let's kill stuff mode. Yeah, you could just show up, and if the gnomes are like, this sucks, and you go, okay, we'll just kill everything, and then you're on your own. Like, you could do that, and that's not good. But, oh yeah, like there's no reinforcements, no. right? It's an isolated city anywhere, so you just and it's a giant city that's mostly abandoned. Mm-hmm. So you go, you kill, you just be ambushing patrols, mm-hmm. and you know, kick down the door, kill a scoutsy, run away, mm-hmm. kick down the door, kill another one. Like it's it's totally doable in that type of type of way. I mean, and also like one thing I didn't understand. Okay, the blood orchid, which is you know, it's a pretty standard monster. Like there's nothing particularly exciting about it, but I never understood the Skeltsy, Skeltsies and blood orchid connection. Like I don't know that there is. I mean, it's obviously one. service to the dark crystal. Yeah, but there's no flower in the dark crystal. No, but there's a dark crystal, and it absorbs essence from the podlings, which are the gnomes, right? So yeah. the flower is the dark crystal, and they're feeding it, right, to get the essence anyway. Sure. But yeah, it's like, nah. Oh. You didn't do a very good job. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> um, well, I mean, you could make an adventure about the dark crystal. It should hopefully be a lot more exciting than this. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I guess if you if you line it up that way, it totally makes sense. There's just some dodgy bits that don't really yeah fit with uh, fit with me. I don't have much more to say about the adventure because I think we'll just start talking in circles. Uh, yeah, I think we reached that point where like we're we're just we're coming up with cool ideas more than we're actually talking mm-hmm. about the adventure itself. In short, interesting idea, right? The, the conceptually, I thought there's a cool idea here i felt that for a published adventure there should be a little bit more adventure Mm -hmm. in it uh and i think if nothing else it really lacks a defined win condition yep right because as written it's like let's muck about in here until we get bored and then we leave yep right uh there's no incentive for the the pcs to really deal with the scouts or the blood orchid Mm -hmm. other than like they want to be good people which not all PCs are inherently good. Yeah. Good, uh, and I don't. I don't like that as an approach in general. Right? Like you might have PCs, you know, players that are like, let's just be heroes for the sake of being heroes. But I feel that you should always have some reason to do it. Yeah. And it all you can even just be that like the blood orchid is in the treasure room, <laughs> right? Like it is true. Yeah. <laughs> um... Or or you know you you can find out that the heart of a blood orchid sells for like 5,000 GP, you know, to, you know, cause it's, it's a main component of magic items. So mm-hmm. it's, there's a huge market for it. Like you just had to put some sort of mercenary reason in there True. for the PCs to want to engage with the conflict. There's just no conflict. I guess that's the whole thing. Like other than implied horror about the situation, there, there isn't a conflict, and I make I find that difficult to run an adventure when there's no conflict. I agree. Um, sorry, Steve. Is this if this finds its way to you? Listen, get back to us, maybe if you can. <laughs> We'd love to hear your thoughts. We're just a couple of random guys <laughs> on the internet. So. Uh, as always, thanks for listening, guys. Um, you can email us uh, at theimpanogre at gmail dot com or on the twitters at theimpanogre. 
Um, we'll get back to you when we can. And next week we are tackling the created, which is an AD and D second edition adventure. As always, thanks for listening. Thanks.